My talk is called Growing a Studio in a Post-Indie Industry. Um, as Les said, my name is Joe Marabello. I'm the founder and creative director at Terrell Posture Games. Um, and uh, this talk is going to be a little bit personal. Um, this is part history lesson about Terrell Posture Games, a little bit about some of the things I've learned along the way, and a little bit about what we've been up to over the last year or two. Um, at times, uh, I'm going to have to be a little bit coy because I can't contractually go into details. Um, many of you will probably find this talk to be too simple because a lot of what I'm going to talk about uh, ends up being common sense if you've been in this industry for a while, but it wasn't for me. It's taken me a bit of time for some of this common sense to really sink in, um, and I'm happy to share it with you all, and hopefully, uh, um, uh, hopefully it won't take as long for others for it to sink in as it did for me. Um, so first off, who is Terrell Posture Games? Uh, last time I spoke to Boston Postmortem was November 2018. Um, as Les had described, we had just released a game called Mother Gunship, and I did a postmortem on the game. At the time, Terrell Posture Games was only like four people, five people, I think. Um, nowadays, we're somewhere between 15 and 25 people, depending on how you count us. Uh, we're also between three and 10 years old, depending on how you count that. And we've also released somewhere between three and nine titles, depending on how you count that. Uh, I can go into why those numbers are so weird if anyone is curious, but right now I'll just move on because it's funnier if I don't explain. Anyway, every year that we've been in existence has been a little bit different. The sheer number of years and number of releases means that compared to a lot of other small studios, we've been pretty stable. Um, we've had to figure out a few strategies along the way, though, in order to make that happen. Um, so first I want to kind of talk about how Terrible Hasha Games was formed. Uh, Ten years ago, uh, I was working happily as a senior technical artist in the AAA industry at a local MMO studio, um, and I worked for that company from 2007 when it was when it started all the way until it closed its doors in 2012. Um, and uh, at night, I wrote just for fun. Uh, I always enjoyed writing, and and I used my evenings to enrich that part of my creative skill set. I published a few short stories. I did uh, NaNoWriMo as many years as I could. That's the National Novel Writing Month. I tracked my word counts. Um, over the course of that period, I ended up writing something like a million words in those evenings. And I had also thought about one day going indie um, as a game dev. Uh, I really uh, liked what I was seeing in the indie community for games, and I wanted to join that. Uh, I did eventually, right after I stopped working for this company that uh, I was working at. Um, but before I go into that story, I want to take a small dive into the world of ebooks as it existed. 10 years ago. Uh, and I promise this is going to be relevant. Um, but uh, to start us off, in uh, 2010, 2011, I spent my days working on somebody else's game and my nights writing and thinking about someday releasing a novel. So anybody can write a book. By 2010, all of the kinks had been worked out of Amazon's ebook scene, and there was a stigma that no one ever reads books on e-readers. That had faded. Um, that had been a thing back then, but by 2010, it was kind of gone. Um, suddenly, anybody could publish a book and anyone could read it, and it felt like some kind of barrier had been removed. This was a very sudden and amazing shift. Like, basically before this there was bookstores and that was it, and those were a walled garden. And now suddenly I felt like I could achieve my goal of making something and bringing it to somebody. By 2011, I had published a novel. And we were told, as writers who were participating on and, and kind of contributing to this ebook world, uh, that it didn't matter who you were or who you knew, we were told that we could share our creations with anyone. I sold 27 copies that year, and I knew all except for three of my customers personally. I suddenly found myself in a very, very crowded world, and, you know, it didn't really bother me that much. Um, I still just enjoyed the act of making things. Just the act of creation itself was fun, and this was a hobby, and I did it for me. Um, but the fact is, I wasn't alone, and in 2011, when I released that book, it was right at the beginning of a tidal wave, and that tidal wave kind of looked like this. Um, at its release, the Kindle uh, at the time I released that book, uh, the Kindle store had 600, uh, about 600,000 books on it, um, right there, 2011. Um, since old books don't really become obsolete, today it's more like one in nine million. There are a lot of books there. And I learned a very harsh truth, and that's that very, 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 very few writers had their name on more than one book. Today, this kind of death by obscurity feels like kind of common knowledge. I feel like we're basically born into this world knowing that uh, if you release something on the Amazon ebook store, no one will read it. Uh, Ten years ago, we didn't really know that. Uh, 
especially since there were people who had kind of cracked the code. There were some people who actually were flourishing in that environment. As crowded as it was, there were people who managed to succeed very well, and not every name was lost in the crowds. We'll come back to this in a minute. Um, in May of 2012, literally 10 years ago, uh, I left AAA. The large MMO company that Les had mentioned that I'd been working for with him went out of business quite suddenly, and almost as a knee-jerk reaction, I set out to make something that was entirely the opposite of an MMO. Instead of a game that was made by hundreds of developers for thousands of concurrent players, Tower of Guns was the silly little FPS made by a single developer for a single player. And I had a really, really modest goal. All I wanted to do was earn $50,000 and then maybe I would go back to work in AAA again. I was treating this like a sabbatical, not really like a career. Um, back when I had written that novel, just the year prior, uh, it felt like there were a thousand writers for every single reader. Uh, on Steam, it seemed like there were a thousand players for every single game, like the numbers were flipped. Back then, Steam was a closed ecosystem. It was a walled garden. If you found your way in, you would find an audience. And in March of 2014, I released Tower of Guns on Steam, and then the indie apocalypse happened. Um, so the date of this varies. Uh, some people say 2015, some say 2016, some say 2018, but for the uninitiated, this was the term applied by the old guard to the democratization of the platforms like Steam. It was the removal of the walls from the gardens so that anyone could publish a game on Steam, uh, leading to a flood of games. I first heard the term in 2015, and I kind of felt like it was outdated even then because I would argue that it started in 2014, when the first Steam Greenlight games were coming to market. Steam was a walled garden, and Tower of Guns was one of the first games waiting at the door when Valve figured out how they wanted to open them. Uh, as, I became, as, I, as I grew to know more and more developers around me, a lot of my peers were complaining about this indie apocalypse, the indie apocalypse, but I would kind of keep quiet because I kind of knew that I was the indie apocalypse. Um, but that said, Tower Guns did hit its goal of $50,000, actually within a week or two, and it ended up doing pretty well, um, especially comparatively. Uh, eventually, I worked with another studio to bring it to consoles, and while the floodgates of the indie apocalypse were open, I kind of knew that it was going to get much worse. Um, and it didn't really bother me that much, because I just enjoyed the act of making things. This was a sabbatical. I did it for me. This was just for fun. Let's fast forward a couple years. Mother Gunship uh, was a roguelite follow-up with a very, very, very unique gun crafting system. You basically built guns out of Lego parts. It was a lot of fun to make and is a really wacky game. This was built in collaboration with the company that had helped me bring tower guns to consoles, named Grip Digital. Um, they, uh, they, we liked working together and they literally came to me and said, you are a uh, director, we have a team, would you like to direct a sequel of Tower Guns with us? Um, and it seemed interesting, and I said yes. Eventually, that game became Mother Gunship. And throughout the development, I learned an awful lot about running a team, about bringing things to market, and eventually about building a company. This was a major shift for Terrible Posture Games. Um, suddenly, it, Terrible Posture Games wasn't just a cute pseudonym for me. Um, now there was an us. Um, towards the end of development, I incorporated Terrible Posture Games, hired myself, as well as a number of contractors that I've been working with. A couple of them are actually in the audience right here. I can point out Liam and PJ. Uh, I know I saw in the in the, uh, um, the crowds, they actually worked with me on this. Um, Mother Gunship was released in uh, 2018, and uh, I was worried. Um, I didn't want to put anybody in the situation that my previous employer, that big MMO studio, had put its team in. Uh, if I was going to run a company, if I was actually going to have employees and a team, then I was going to have to take a different attitude. Um, I was going to do my best to foster creativity, and in order to do that, I needed to provide stability. Um, I was partially worried about being a good leader, but I was also worried for another reason. This is the graph of game releases on Steam per year. Uh, you can see that in 2014, uh, there was kind of the beginning of this tidal wave. That's when Tower of Guns came out. And then in 2018, we're over here. Um, you can see how things were beginning to get a little bit exciting. So let's talk about post-indie. Uh, I had suddenly found myself in a very crowded world. Um, this time, it actually bothered me greatly. Um, it suddenly did matter how much I made. This was not just a hobby. My idea that this was going to be a sabbatical was long gone. This was a second career now. And I was not just doing this for me anymore. This was I was doing this for a team of people. It was not just for fun. Um, 
So the term post-indie is literally a term I made up because less needed a title for this talk. Um, I didn't put a whole lot of thought into the term, but it does speak to the tactics that we've had to take to get by. Um, yes, I know the term indie is short for independent, uh, but the word indie has kind of a certain intimacy implied. There's this uh, implication of artistic integrity, even potentially beyond practicality. Um, I use the term post-indie to refer to kind of a getting serious attitude that I've seen. Not just with Terrible Pasha Games, but with a lot of older indies over the last four years. This post-indie era involves a little bit more calculation. It involves being smart as well as being creatively passionate. Um, it's a step beyond just enjoying making things for the sake of making them. There will always be breakout indie developers. Um, there will always be those who hit the lottery of the right skills, the right time, and find the right audience. They will always be there. Um, and I don't actually think that their success is actually purely luck. I also don't like the idea of being so carefree and reliant on luck with the livelihoods of my team. So I needed to adopt a post-indie mindset, and I needed to learn quickly from those around me. Um, and through all of this, I couldn't help but have a sense of deja vu. This is the Kindle graph that I showed earlier, and the Steam graph overlaid. Don't think too much about this image. The two graphs were measuring, they weren't even measuring the same uh, actual kind of numbers. This is just a visual statement to get you on the same headspace with me. Um, there were... People who had survived the ebook scene, the crowded ecosystem, and had thrived in it. And uh, as I was thinking back to those days, I, I kind of realized that they had a few things in common. So um, I came up with kind of a mental cheat, cheat sheet. And I apologize for how rudimentary this list is going to be. I didn't go to marketing school, and I imagine a lot of this is marketing 101, but here's what I observed. For successful novelists, um, the cheat sheet to, to thrive in a crowded ecosystem seemed to look like this. One, be someone. Two, be a big brand. Three, spend a whole lot of money. Four, make a whole lot of stuff. Be cheap. Have a hook. Be in the right place at the right time. Let's go through these a little slower now. Um, by, by being someone, I mean basically being a big name, a celebrity, being the Stephen King. Stephen King would always get attention uh, if, if he wrote a book. That's just because that's who he was. Um, he had a long history. Uh, for games, this would be someone like Miyamoto. Or it doesn't even need to be an individual. It could be a company. It could be someone like for, you know, From Software. From Software will always get attention whenever they release a game. Case in point, they just released a game. Um, this takes time and a hell of a backlog, and maybe someday I could cross that one off my list. Second one, write in a big brand. I was realizing that uh, something like a Star Wars Extended Universe book would always sell infinitely better than anything that I would write. Same thing goes for a Star Wars game or any big brand. Working on a big brand takes you seriously. I was not working on a big brand, so I can cross that one off. Next one, spend money. Big marketing campaigns are a bit like an emperor's new clothes situation, but they work. Um, and Terrible Posture Games has dabbled a little bit with ads here and there um, and with, with sponsorships and paid promotions, but to move the needle on this kind of spending, to move the needle of attention, um, you need to basically add a whole bunch of zeros to the end of what we spent. We've got a lot to, to learn here, and I recognize that spending money to make money works but only if you can afford the cost to play that game. I could cross that one off. Next one, making a lot of stuff. There were some people out there who were writing, and again, I'm talking about eBooks, two or three books a year. Or there were teams, whole teams that were working under pseudonyms together, and they would all release under that same name, and they were releasing tons of books. It was some of the most lucrative eBook writers I, I saw were doing this, and they were excelling at it. It doesn't necessarily mean low quality. Just because it's a lot of stuff, it does not mean low quality. Some of it was, a lot of it was, but not always. Um, and what I did know was that if there was any factor of luck to be to be put on, on the idea of success, um, then I knew that these people were essentially buying two or three or ten times as many lottery tickets as I was. And I wondered that if you could do this, uh, if you were going to be able to do this, and if you still wanted to make quality things, then I suspected that you needed to get really good at releasing often. And to treat releasing a game as a skill. And there's something to this one that I thought about a lot. Um, next one, be cheap. Some companies will pay less. Sometimes they'll schedule in more stuff. Sometimes they'll crunch endlessly. They'll fire people right after project ships. This is not who I am or the kind of company I wanted to run. Um, in fact, I wanted to lift the quality of life for my team up year after year, not cut corners. Um, so I could cross that one off. Um, it actually, besides the point, uh, uh, besides the fact that I feel like it's a question of morals, there's actually no way that anyone in this room 
um, this virtual room will ever be able to work cheaper than anyone uh, in various other parts of the world. Like this is basically a losing game. If you try and be cheaper than them, you won't win. Um, the cost of living is just completely different. The next one, having a hook. Um, or put another way, making something fresh. Um, the moment you saw gameplay of Carrion, or of Teardown, or of Mudrunners, you knew exactly how the press would write about it. Um, having a hook is something that all of us should be practicing from the get-go, and it just makes the press's job easier. But that's kind of a surface-level read on this. When I was taking this, this thought and applying it to games, um, I realized that I should be thinking about it sooner. Um, it's not necessarily having a hook for what you want the player to experience, but also for where you're going to find funding, if you're going out to look for funding, um, which we were. Um, so uh, basically, if we were seeking funding for our next project, we had to have that hook right away thought out and polished, because every group out there that was looking to fund a game uh, had a bag of money that was a particular shape. And I wanted to know what that shape was and make sure that my hook tied into that shape as well as possible. Um, this mindset doesn't need to involve secret info or any kind of, of back-channel conversations. Sometimes it just involves watching the big guys at the poker table and making some educated guesses about what they're thinking. Uh, for example, right now, I don't know very much at all about PlayStation VR. I don't know anything that's not public about PlayStation VR 2. Um, but if I were them, I know I'd be watching the Quest 2 closely. Uh, what do they need? What does what does PlayStation VR 2's team need to make people interested in their stuff over the Quest 2? What can they do that the Quest 2 can't? That's a question that has an answer that is a particular shape, and that shape could be worth millions of dollars in funding. Um, the next one is be in the right place. Now, this is multifaceted. Um, it's making the right thing at the right time, sure, but it's also getting the best featuring, which is often something that people don't really think about. In any bookstore, to go back again to books, um, the best sellers were always on the end or always at eye height or in the center islands. Uh, the big question is, were they placed there because they were selling well or were they selling well because they were placed there? Um, grocery stores will actually charge companies money for the end caps or for the eye level placement, and they'll charge a lot. And there are some game platforms out there that are not much different with their carousel spots or their page banners. They know they are gold. Um, and I knew it was going to be crucial in this crowded market to find ways to get our games in the right place. That alone is worth more than any single marketing spend that I could ever do. Um, just getting my game in the right place. So uh, let's talk now a little bit about 3 out of 10. Um, excuse me for a minute while I get a quick sip of a beverage. So in July of 2019, I took a trip down to Epic in North Carolina to pitch 3 out of 10 to them. Um, it was a playable sitcom about the world's worst video game studio ever, where the developers had never released a game that had ever scored above 3 out of 10. It was a really weird idea that was a hybrid between a game and a cartoon, and it essentially was, was a cartoon, like a Saturday morning cartoon, divided up with mini games and exploration phase, phases and rendered entirely in real time. I had shown Epic an early demo at GDC a few months prior, and they'd been intrigued. Um, I was presenting them with a essentially this episodic cartoon game built entirely in their engine, designed to be released for free in weekly installments exclusively to their store, playable in short bursts, and showcasing all the different wild ways you could make things quickly with Unreal 4. You can kind of see how the shape of this hook really seems to be uh, particularly crafted. Um, we did all our own rigging, animating, compositing, all within Unreal 4, seamlessly blending between the different game modes and, and story modes. Um, the episodes had everything from FPS segments to pinball to Zelda clones to completely new genres. It was a really wild project. You can play it now for free, um, even still. Um, 3 out of 10 let us build some really cool technology that we use all over our projects, and we got to, a lot of, we got to wear a lot of really interesting hats while making stuff. Um, while we pitched this project to a lot of different partners, um, and quite a few were interested and had second or third conversations with us, we knew that the Epic sh Epic Store was probably going to be the best fit. At least we hoped it was. Um, we hoped that they would see the shape of this game and feel like it fit into their puzzle of what they were looking for. Um, and sure enough, we did end up working with Epic on the game. Um, we also released a second season six months later, a Switch version of the first season, um, and we're figuring out where to go from there. We're currently also in ongoing collaborations with DJ2, um, those are the guys who put together the newer Sonic movies about exploring television options for 3 out of 10.
Um, and as we moved development onto season two, I realized that we had hit some of the items from my list quite accidentally pretty well. Um, the game had allowed us to release a lot of content quickly. We built up our skills as a team and our sense of polish. We treated the development a little bit like a TV show, with each episode having a very regular, regular paced and measured pace, uh, measured path rather. Um, and we got our estimations down really good for how long an episode would take to make. Um, and that kind of precision is kind of unheard of in this industry. We basically got a ton of practicing, releasing a ton of stuff. Um, the game had a pretty interesting, unique hook. It was a playable sitcom, and that turned the head of press and players, and it was a little bit weird, but it was also the barrier to entry was so low that people were curious, and they came to check it out. We managed to be in the right place at the right time, we read the room, and we came to Epic with a project that seemed like something they had never seen. And when we released, they supported the game. We received support from them on a technical level, on a storefront level, they featured the game every episode in their carousel, and millions of people ended up claiming the game. Now, because the game was free, you can't really call it lucrative for us, but it did give us a measured bit of stability, and we ended up, oh, I don't know, tripling in size by the end? Um, but that's not all that we've been up to over the last few years. Let's talk about Mother Gunship uh, Forge. About a month ago, we announced Mother Gunship Forge, a VR follow-up to the original Mother Gunship. This is a standalone game made entirely, uh, exclusively for VR. And here's a little trailer. I'm going to go ahead and play this. Uh, hopefully the music comes through. First-person shooter. Now even more first-person. Welcome back, recruit. You do something different with your hair? You know the deal. Aliens first. Let's slow stuff up. Come on, that's all you got. That won't get you out of this, recruit. But upgrades might build the weapon of your dreams. Oh, who's gonna go boom boom? Oh, you are. Huh. Intuitive and powerful. You got friends? Bring them and die. Uh, I mean, fight together. Oh, oh. More, more, more! Okay, enough, too much. No, that's just... Seriously? I'm starting to think this was a bad idea. Okay, that was the trailer for that. One moment while I go back to my slides. Okay, um, so we started work on this about a year ago. Um, and by release, uh, this project will have been in development for like 13, 14 months of development, depending on how you count the starting point, um, which is not too bad considering we had very minimal VR dev experience going into this. Um, uh, but I had a lot of faith in my team at the onset of the project. I knew the technical requirements were pretty nicely aligned to the skills of my team. Um, to go back a few years, uh, during the development of uh, the original Mother Gunship, uh, we actually considered briefly working on a VR experience. This was back in 2017, maybe? Um, potentially as a promo for Mother Gunship. Um, we never had the time or the resources to really pull it off, and I had some questions about um, how, uh, how much it would divert our attention away from the main development. I feel like that was the right call at the time. Um, so what changed between then and now? Well, a few things. First thing is Quest 1, Quest 2 came out. VR was something I was fascinated with as a fan, but the cost for a player to enter and, and really get into VR was so high uh, that it was very hard to responsibly justify the prices of development. Remember, I was trying to take on this post-indie excuse me, this post -indie mindset. Um, and when the Quest came along, suddenly we had something that was standalone, affordable, fairly polished, and it actually pulled in the numbers. I could uh, justify the idea of uh, all these VR ideas I had. I could suddenly justify putting a team on them. Um, second, uh, TPG uh, acquired the full rights to Mother Gunship. Uh, the sticky part about Mother Gunship um, was that it was made and owned by two companies, meaning that for years, very little could be done without, uh, without the approval of both parties. That hurdle was cleared um, when TPG had an opportunity to attain the full rights to the brand, and we did. And then lastly, uh, this goes out to uh, Neil uh, Lorenzo from SkyMap, a fellow New England uh, studio. Probably, I don't know if he's in this chat, but he certainly is on this Discord. Um, he kept poking me about the idea. His enthusiasm got me thinking more and more about it. And the more I thought about it, the more I began to see how the unique design of this game, of the crafting in this game, how intuitive it could be, how easy it could be, and how much fun it would be. I could basically see the game in front of me um, and exactly how we would build it.
So, and now, as we're coming to the last leg of development, this game is infinitely more intuitive than in VR than I would have, uh, than I could have imagined. To quote a recent preview article from COG Connected, uh, they had a small amount of time with a hands-on demo, and they said, it doesn't just feel like this game was made for VR, it feels like VR was made for this game. And that is a pretty nice compliment indeed. Um, but that is not all we've been up to. We're also working on this. I can't talk much about it. It's a Walking Dead game called The Walking Dead Last Mile. All I'm allowed to say is that we are contributing to it, um, and uh, it's kind of a combo of game and streaming event. There's a little bit online that you can find if you go, go and do some Googling. We are only a very small piece of this project, but it's a thing. Um, we are, uh, essentially, we had a very particular set of skills coming off of 310. And Skybound, the um, owners, uh, or I should say the, the holders of the Walking Dead IP, uh, they were looking for someone with those skills. Um, now, 3 out of 10 is about as far away from Walking Dead as you can get, um, but they were the thing that brought us to Skybound's attention, and it just goes to show your career is a progression of steps on a staircase, and each step is supported by the last one. This project involves daily collaboration with teams of many people all across many across many time zones all over the world, and we were also very good at that, so it's uh, it's worked out pretty well. Um, but that's not all we've been up. Excuse me. But that's not all we've been up to. But that's all we're going to talk about right now. Um, we're also working on more stuff, but we're not talking about that yet. So that said, you've seen a few different projects here. Uh, you've seen a big brand. You've seen that we're working in new territories on new platforms. Uh, a little bit about our collaborations with big partners. Let's talk about what's worked well over the last couple of years. Um, Multiple projects mean that we're able to spread the risk around. No single project breaks the studio, and this helps build the company as, as a brand, because the company itself is a brand. There's always something around the corner. In theory, it means that we can skip that awful industry habit of hiring surges followed by layoffs, um, in theory. Uh, so uh, this also means we've built up some good relationships. We've found new partners. We've worked really well with them. Our reputation as a partner that can be trusted to deliver on time and on budget at a high quality is becoming established. People like working with us and generally want to work with us again. Um, we've also gotten to make some cool stuff. Uh, that says that basically says everything right there. Um, we've also managed to grow in a way that I feel is responsible and measured. This again gets back to that point of skipping the awful industry habit of hiring surges followed by layoffs. Um, Growing slow and steady um, has has allowed us to kind of uh, avoid that. Um, I like to think we've also been able to, uh, by growing slow and steady, we've also fostered a culture where people generally are able to kind of get to know each other and care about each other's well-being. Um, and with every year bringing new projects and different kinds of challenges, I feel like the last thing you can say about Terrible Hasha Games is that it's boring. We are never bored, and I consider that a plus. But that said, all of our problems can be, uh, not everything worked well, and all of our problems can be summarized with a single word, and that's whiplash. The idea that people switching focus, uh, well, uh, we were worried that that could lead to people not doing their best work or to a general sense of unhappiness. Um, we predicted this a little bit and have tried our best to keep people on only a single team at a time, and for the most part, we've done that, but not entirely. And some people, a few in particular, um, namely myself and a producer, um, we live in a constant state of juggling too much. So we don't have systemic crunch, but I'd be lying to say if there weren't waves of busy, busy times, this week is actually one of them, and um, I'd like to change that. I'd like to change this this whiplash feeling that I feel for myself. And part of that is going to be also figuring out my own schedule. Um, I've worked hard to keep the hours reasonable for my team, but I myself have not worked under a 40-hour week since 2016. Uh, most of my weeks are way more than that. Um, this is not something that I consider to be a positive. This is a failing, and I accept it because I'm the business owner. So if things go well, then I do well, but also because I see a path uh, to a future where this is not going to be the case. And uh, this gets a bit heartbreaking, but in order to combat this, I basically have to take a step back from, from being active in development myself. I've done a lot of concepts and directing and lots of support work on Mother Gunship Forge, but I have only made a single check-in to the build itself. Um, and even that was a joke check-in. And this is kind of heartbreaking because creating things is what I enjoy. That's why I got into this business. But again, we're a post-indie studio now and uh, I can't enjoy making things just for the sake of making them. Um, this is more about me uh, showing up for the team. So let's go back to this sheet one last time, this reductive survival cheat sheet. Um, looking forward, as con conflicted as I am, I do want to say that I found reward, rewarding elements in everywhere else in my job. 
um, I come away from my job at the end of the day feeling really excited to be working in this industry with this team. I am excited about the projects we're working on and the people I work with. I'm proud of everything we've done. And we've actually hit a really surprising number of the items on this list over the last few years. I've also learned though that this list, like basically the more I've learned about growing a studio, the more I've learned that this list is really short-sighted and is super reductive and is super limited. And I feel like this is just the baby steps. These days, my list looks a little bit more like this. These are the kinds of things that are in my head most days. Um, we're not great at all of these, but these are all important. And Terrible Posture Games, uh, as a studio, we want to improve on all of them. And as long as we improve year over year, I feel confident that we'll continue to grow bigger and better with every project. So that was my talk. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, does anybody have any questions? Is that list again? <laughs> the list again? Pretty sure, sure I second. saw blood sacrifices on there. I that was just to see if you all the <laughs> Joe, that was excellent. That was really good. Thank you so much. I I feel like I have gleaned much knowledge. <laughs> I uh, really awesome. was yeah. trying to clock it. I think it came in at 25 minutes, but I don't actually know what I ended up with. But I will go ahead and I'll post in the QA questions place. There, that's the list for you. Blood sacrifice is not a serious item. <laughs> Maybe. Oh. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. <clears throat> Lights, I stop. Be nice to. Were we just? Didn't we just have an event about QA? Like we did few, have an event about QA, ago? and one of our takeaways yeah. was be nice to QA. Um, I I actually have a question for you, Joe. Um, yeah. So you mentioned uh, while you were working in AAA, uh, you were you know you were also writing on the side, like you know creatively and for fun. Um. I was wondering if, uh, you know, you ever had issues with, like, having, I guess, too much creative burnout, like, you know, doing both a creative thing for your job and doing a creative thing as a hobby. Like, I'm wondering if that, uh, if, if that at all, uh, if you ever had issues balancing those. Um, not really. I mean, partially, yes. Uh, the, the idea of creative burnout doesn't really apply to, to to me historically. Uh, what happens to me is I start getting excited about other projects instead, and that becomes really conflicting. Um, uh, I, that feels... I want to make too many things, and uh, fortunately, when I was doing a lot of tech work at uh, at, at the MO studio that shall go and remain unnamed, although I guess I don't know why because Les named it earlier, um, I was doing a lot of technical work during the day. So there was kind of this different sort of of uh of creative outlet i was doing different kinds of things at night versus you know during the day um i guess the other part of it is that um i recharge myself very easily um in fact i have trouble playing games because or watching movies or reading books because they start giving me ideas um so if i'm ever feeling burned out on a creative thing i just need to go and play a game for a couple of hours and that will inspire me um, I do consider that to be important, and I do play games uh, more than just Slay the Spire, as much as I was joking earlier on in our call. Um, uh, but um, I find that me personally, I, I get uh, recharged pretty quickly. Um, uh, that doesn't mean that I don't get burned out in other ways, but you know, the, the ideas and the creativity are things that I wish I had infinite time for because I feel like I would put it to good use. Um, Rad. Hey, thank you. Great answer. <laughs> I can I relate a, to that. <laughs> I have a small question, um, or a big one, depending on, I, I suppose, your reaction to it. Um, in this process, because um, you said you were someone that um, that finds that or that enjoys creating things, have have you um, found that the fun of building something of uh of uh crafting of creating been more solidified or dampened through this experience um can you rephrase the question a little bit do you mean my personal level of fun or do you mean just yeah, the, the, the um, fun of the games or what do you mean? your personal level of fun like from your experience have you found that you are having more or less fun with the game design process or with um i, I suppose with with what you make now or what what you um consider your game design experience 
Um, it's a little bit of both camps. Uh, so there are things that are less fun. Um, I don't like having to do the bookkeeping every month. It's something that needs to be done. Um, and there are these aspects of my job that take me away from the fun part, which is making, making the game. But that's replaced with something that I wasn't expecting, and that's a real sense of pride. I look at Mother Gunship Forge, and uh, I look at how good that game is. And yes, my, my thumbprint is, is there in the game, but I did so little check-ins to it. I did, well, not basically, um, that uh, I can be separated a little bit, and I can look at the team and what they've done, and I can be like, I am responsible for this team. Even if I don't have too much uh, in the way of check-ins for this game, I can feel creatively energized by what they are doing, and I can feel creative pride in fostering this environment for them. Um, and and that mindset of, of service has, has been a really good fuel for me, um, because there are parts of my job that are not fun. Um, I don't like having to go do pitches. I think I've gotten pretty good at it, but, um, you know, if I had my way, I'd just be sitting there making, you know, just painting cartoons all day, writing, not necessarily... But I would be making stuff with the team. I would definitely be in, be doing things from day to day with the team. Um, that the I guess the the other aspect is that now I can go in and I can see the game's progress as a essentially the first objective uh, uh, perspective. So when you start working on a game too closely, you really quickly get lost um, in uh, in the design or in the moment of what you're working on, um, and uh, it's very easy to lose sight of the bigger picture. Even on a even a director can really quickly lose sight of the bigger picture, um, and uh, taking a little bit of a higher level view because of the requirements of space and time um, has basically allowed me to see things clear sometimes, and that's been actually a big benefit. It allows me to get more excited in some cases. I just don't get to make fun things as much on a minute to minute level, but it doesn't mean I'm any less enthusiastic. Hmm. Thank you. That that answers my question. Yes. Great. Um, I have a question, if we still have time. I have no idea how much time we have, so yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, if, building on the two from before, you mentioned how it's very easy to get interested in other topics and making new things. Um, I am interested in how you manage the side of completion, of when there's a project going that I mean, initially, when you were smaller, that you personally have lost interest in or something along those lines. And then as you shift to a larger team where people are relying on the completion of that project, how do you personally and professionally see something started to completion on time uh, in a way that makes everyone happy and not overworked and so on? Uh, a, few, a few things. And 3 out of 10 got us pretty good at this. Um, one is that you need to have... Uh, a good kind of sense of where you're going with it. Um, two, you need to have good producers. Um, we've been very, very, very lucky at Temple Posture Games that I've not had to do all of the scheduling on my own. Uh, I've not been doing very much of it at all, actually, over the last uh, year. Um, it's been very much leaning on the, the eyes of a producer to keep the schedule in check. Um, but the biggest thing is that, and this is something that working on roguelites taught me, um, if you were to look at... And this is why I think the roguelike genre is so interesting. Um, to get a roguelike up and running is not is essentially the game. To get a prototype of a roguelike feeling good is the game. And you can expand it almost infinitely. Case in point, uh, the Binding of Isaac games or, uh, or something like Slay the Spire, which isn't really a roguelike but has similar flexibility in its design. Um, you can expand it infinitely and the game will only benefit from it. The result of that is that you can essentially call it done at any minute, too. Um, you basically are building uh, wide, not tall. Um, not every genre is that flexible, but the roguelike genre really can be if you plan it right. So I highly, highly, highly prioritize prototypes and playables and being able to play the game in a polished experience as fast as possible. Um, and I feel like that is uh, a cheat sheet for making something that is going to be successful later. Um, it's it's getting a blurry version of the picture first and then slowly bringing it into focus. And then you can make a lot more flexible adjustments as time and scope require because you know that the skeleton underneath is pretty sturdy. And even if the picture is a little blurry in places still, it's still readable and you can still say it's doing its job as a picture. Um, 
so I guess hopefully that doesn't get too weird with the uh, with with the analogies there. Um, but uh, but yeah, definitely prioritizing prototypes as fast as possible has been pretty crucial. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Oh wait, shit. Oh. Um, I did you just mute people who were unmuted or who were not making noise who or who were making noise? Oh, I I, I have myself on push to talk. Whoops. Okay. Uh okay, thank you. Hey, I unmuted right, myself. Yeah, I unmuted myself him. after he was done. Hey, Joe, um, I have a quick question. Sure. Uh, so um, th three out of 10 was was kind of the deal. And obviously, it's, I think you can't talk about it. It's cool. But it all it almost struck me like three out of 10, the deal that you might have uh, ultimately made. Um, was that kind of like a Netflix sort of thing? Like, were they were they paying for 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 production? Because because that's really like a different kind of model. Which is, which yeah, is I can't cool. really talk too much about it, but um, uh, I, I will say that uh, that Epic support, yeah, I don't actually know what I can and can't say there, so it's best if I don't get too much into it, but it was a different kind of situation for sure. And that was one of the things that made uh, the companies we were talking to and pitching to intrigued, um, was that this uh, didn't necessarily need to be seen as something that needed to have, quote unquote, uh, uh, monetization. We weren't really really after that um and uh it was not just epic that was interested in this kind of model a lot of different studios were were intrigued by it and you can see the industry has kind of gone more towards this this content is a uh um a resource that is uh uh being being horse traded around the different storefronts right now especially if you look at like things that xbox is doing with the game pass and sony's trying to get up something similar right now you know uh, there's a very interesting sea change that's happening right now with content, and I don't quite know where it's going to be in a couple of years. Um, but uh, we were playing around with different sorts of ways to make this game, and uh, we did. We were very upfront with everyone we talked to, like this game is an experiment. Are you all going to be interested in conducting this experiment with us? And uh, Epic, uh, while I don't claim to know what they were thinking, they seem to be interested in the idea of that experiment. Yeah, yeah, that's it, like like it's really cool, and um, and also you know what what you said about that it's all like one thing leads to another, and that whole trajectory kind of can build on itself, and 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 you you, know, you basically never know where these things are going to go, and I think that's that's kind of in all of game development, that's that's kind of how how a lot of careers happen, careers and 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 the way companies grow and stuff like that. So well, yeah, and, even breakout successes are great. Like even the big things that seem like they came out of nowhere have a long history. You go look up the history of Rocket League, and you know it's not the first game that is like Rocket League that that team has made. Um, it's uh, sometimes it's just a matter of of making something enough times that you really know what you're doing, and then being in the right place at the right time. Leave for that game, yeah. PS Plus deal that really knocked them out of the park. Yeah, the first Doom game. Uh, people think it, that might have been uh, ID's first game, but it was like it was like their 80th. Oh yeah, they've been oh, yeah. working for forever on stuff. In fact, Masters of Doom was a pretty interesting book. I haven't read it in about 15, 20 years now at this point, but it goes into pretty deep, pretty big detail about their uh, their their rise, which was pretty quick, relatively you know, relatively speaking. They were making a game every like eleven months, eight months, six months there in the beginning. I remember um, actually during a. Um there was like a talk with John Romero at WPI a few years ago. Uh, he asked the audience, how, how many games do you think I made before we, we went, landed on like Wolfenstein, for example? And people were like guessing like 24 or like 11 or 30. He said something like 74. And I thought that was like crazy. How do you make 74 games? From yeah, like you got to keep in mind a little yeah. bit though that like, okay, so you can work backwards there. And, uh, you know, like Wolfenstein didn't take a crazy seven year development cycle. It was like one year, maybe a year and a half. And then they built on that another year and a half for Doom. 
but you can work backwards to Commander Kane, and that was a year or two. And they get shorter and shorter and shorter as they go back. They made three Commander Kane games, I think, maybe more, maybe like six. Uh, but yeah, there was a, yeah. before they were even working together, Romero and Carmack, they were making their own little little littler games and selling them. And you know those games were. Uh, I don't want to necessarily downplay them because they were uh, massive uh, endeavors that very few people could do in those days. But it's not like they were building something that was uh, uh, as massive in scope or technical achievement uh, uh, like Doom was or like Wolfenstein was. They were, you know, working on games that could be achieved by one person working evenings and and uh, weekends over the course of a few months. Um, yeah, I think that just to add on a tiny bit on that. Um, mobile is a great area, as is itch for you to cut your teeth making games. Like, don't try to make Elden Ring as your first game, right? Try to make a Pac-Man clone, right? Or try to make a breakout, you know, with one additional feature, right? Get used to the cadence of putting out products, right? Because, I mean, I think, Joe, like, you're saying just get used to the cadence of releasing games, releasing content, releasing updates, and then, you know, you will maybe one day find yourself in the right place, right time. Yeah, it's, um, I, I have a big problem with the idea of the magnum opus game um, because I feel like you're not going to make a good game that way. Um, I feel like you're much better off with, if you make 10 games and you spend one-tenth of the amount of time on each one compared to that magnum otis, opus, excuse me, um, by the time you get to that 10th game, even though you're only going to be spending a fraction of the time that you would have um, on that other game, the one that took you the whole suite of time, it will be an infinitely better game. Um, that's the like thousand pots idea. If you take two teams and give one of them a thousand, what was it? What is, how does it work? Uh, two people, uh, one person you say make a pot every single day. And then the other person you say you have thousand days to make one pot. The people that are working on a thousand pots will by their thousandth one have a amazingly better pot than the one who was working one pot for the entire time. Um, and it's just a, a, a nature of the figuring out how to do stuff. You learn by repetition, but you also develop instincts about what works and what doesn't. Um, they, you know, those developers won't even be aware of what they're doing and why it works or why it doesn't. It's just ingrained into them. Uh, instinctually, they know when they're going to be making mistakes or wasting time or what to do to be efficient, what to pay attention to, uh, how to release something. All of these things gradually are part of not just individuals, but also a team's skill set. Would you say that um, that this sort of like make it until you make it um, strategy is 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 applicable to more than just game design, or do you think it's more unique into creative endeavors rather than life in general? I oh, do you mean does it apply to other elements of your life as opposed to just creative? I mean, sure. I know it applies to other creative things. Uh, this is yeah. actually a very common tactic for teaching people how to paint. Um, it's basically progressive iteration. Um, and you can like look up some tutorials about uh, iterative practice. Um, it's not the idea of just drawing the same thing over and over again, but the idea of looking critically at your work and drawing a lot, you can become better by iterating um, on your work and doing a lot of things over and over again uh, than you would from spending a whole bunch of time on one picture. That's pretty true i feel like for a lot of creative fields writing is similar i feel like but i think you could probably apply it to i think you could probably apply it to a lot of other trades you probably could apply it to sports and exercise without too much difficulty i don't know if i could speak with much, with much authority though about anything outside the creative um i actually have a quick question yeah oh uh, the, i completely forgot what it was um i remember now so like you're saying the idea of like a magnum opus game you don't like it and i get that but like i have a vision of a magnum opus game that takes place like i'm planning on it probably being the last game i ever make like it's in the very very distant future like is there any problem with that like having a game in mind that i can very clearly see in my head but um, I also see, like, at at the very least, like, 20 games leading up to that one. I think very few people plan to make their magnum opus, and that ends up being their magnum opus. 
Yeah, yeah. I feel like also you could treat that like a North Star. Like maybe you can make stuff that gets you towards that direction. But if you get it too stuck in your head about what it's going to be, you're going to miss the opportunities of everything that you've learned along the way. Um, so just be careful about that. And, and uh, so I, I so I guess what I meant by like um, see it clearly in my head, like I have a lot of ideas for the game, I guess. And there's a lot of stuff that I don't think will be technically possible by the time I get there that I want in the game. So that's fun. But yeah. Just be flexible, I guess. And also, don't have one idea. Have 10 ideas. Have 20 ideas. Have 100 ideas. Because if you treat one idea as too precious, then you may find that you're developing yourself into a corner. I, at any one time, I've got 10, 20 different ideas of things that I want to to make someday. So the idea of wanting to work on something someday and even kind of going down the, the exercise of jotting down design notes and thinking about how it would actually play out, that can be a good exercise, but I do think that there's value in in not just having one. Um, and uh, and um, I, I, don't, I don't know if the idea of having a North Star game like that is a bad idea. And I call it a North Star game because... It's like the idea of the North Star. You know, it orients you in the sky. You may never get to it, but it helps you clear yourself. Um, and uh, uh, if that helps you make more things, then I personally don't think it's a terrible idea. But I, I myself like to have several different ideas that are kind of always percolating. Okay, thank you. Uh, I have a small question about um, you. You had mentioned... I forget the exact wording. It was something along the lines of um, making something unique and making it so that it stands out in a... You said provide a hook. That was it. Um, and I wanted uh, to ask you a little more about that. And um, because I wanted to know... Um, are are there any like good avenues towards finding these hooks like good ways to find um more interesting branching out ways to explore game design as a medium in order to get um more uh more interesting more diverse more unique uh creations to be produced um i don't know i feel like that's a million dollar question right there um <laughs> you know can you basically Sorry. yeah you know uh uh, create a formula for generating hooks that then would be interesting. And, you know, I don't know. Um, I do know that if you let yourself explore gameplay and do different things with it and then skin it with story, like if you keep story away from the game as long as you can, then you can write a story that fits the hook when you find it. And that's pretty useful. But that, that takes uh, a little bit of restraint because you have to be very aware that the gameplay is first and foremost in your game. And not every game celebrates gameplay as its first major selling point. Case in point, the Telltale games. Those things are not gameplay first games, but they're still very compelling. Um, their major hook is the story. Um, so I, I guess it entirely depends on the goal of the project. And uh, if you have the luxury to prototype a bunch of different things, um, then you can find a hook anywhere. Um, you can find hooks in gameplay. You can find it in art. Um, you can even find it in something that's a little bit more awkward to describe, but ends up being a, a sublime co combination of things. And again, From Software is actually a really good example of this. They're, they don't really have a, a hook for their games other than that it is From Software's next game. Um, <laughs> you know, For all of the advertising they had done about George Martin writing up that world, I haven't seen that in any of the reviews. Well, I mean, I guess I have, but they're talking about how good of a game it is. Um, it's a good game painting a really compelling world and with really good mechanics and it is their hook beyond anything else is that it is another really good from software game and that can be enough um you know certainly earlier on the from software hooks were this is difficult um and that that did the you know at least that was a hook that they were you could see in some of their their materials um but uh for them their their hook is themselves and i think that that's kind of a cool thing um i think that that Double Fine can kind of sometimes be the same way. Their hook is themselves, because Double Fine has a very fun quality about almost all of their stuff. Um, but, uh, you know, it I takes agree. a lot of work for a developer to become the hook then, uh, to become the hook themselves. Um, I don't want to ask too many, like, questions here, but I, I do, I am wondering, um, 
and, and thank you for answering that one. That was a very um, informative answer. Um, but the um, when it comes to hooks, because you you clearly have created some games with some very fascinating hooks here um, that you just showcased us. Uh, would you mind like telling us about the process you you had leading towards those hooks? Um, I think back about. I mean, a lot of them were were kind of discovered by accident through prototyping. Um, the idea of Tower of Guns being this... Tower of Guns had its very, had a very weird hook. We wanted to make a first-person shooter bullet hell with randomized elements, and you can kind of see how I'm adding a lot of adjectives into here, and it's already getting a little bit muddy. It's my first game, okay? Um, but I basically... Well, first solo game. Um, I basically was uh, um, looking at Isaac, and I really was impressed with Binding of Isaac and how fun it was to play. And... Um, uh, I saw the idea of combining those elements as a unique thing. But that didn't end up really being what the hook of, of the game was. Uh, accidentally, throughout development, we discovered that uh, through a bug, um, I had some people who would play test the game, and every so often they'd give me feedback. And there was one day a, a, a bug that caused, well, I think it was 10 times as many bullets to spawn, but they were a tenth of the speed, somewhere some numbers had gotten mixed up. And uh, it created this huge star field of bullets everywhere that you could actually navigate pretty nicely. Um, and that ended up becoming a really unique selling point of the game, this idea of this bullet ballet. Um, and so in some cases, hooks can just be found accidentally. Um, Molly Gunship's crafting system was the brainchild of a very talented technical designer who was trying to think about how to combine some random scribbled designs that, uh, that we had... Uh, handed to him about what we had in our mind. Uh, and then he, I have, to look, I have to think back about how that happened, but it was definitely a combination of him coming up with a way to intuitively use the crafting system we had designed, which was much simpler actually. And then all of a sudden we realized that we could take off some of the training wheels and we had a crafting system that was really robust and actually quite fun and didn't need to have quite as many guardrails on it because we were making a silly game and um, you could let them build a gun that had 18 barrels and that was okay. Um, so that again was a kind of an accidental and recognizing the accident was better than the original recipe. Um, I find a lot of joy in, in the uh, Bob Ross happy accidents of game design. Um, so that's two examples right there. <laughs> um, actually, to give a third real quick, uh, I, we haven't talked about this game yet, but there's a game we're developing where the core design was something that was inspired by uh, one of the mini games uh, in a three out of ten episode, which three out of ten uh, had a ton of mini games in it, and that would do playful little experiments. And occasionally, we struck upon something that was very interesting, and that mini game was in turn inspired by other games. So it was kind of like a twist of a mechanic in a new way that then was twisted again in another way, and so that had a very slow evolution. But um, that game. Uh, when it comes out, I'm excited to see what people think because it is actually a really intriguing for loop that I have not seen in other games before. So uh, that leaves you all with a little bit of a teaser, I guess. All right. Thank you. Hey, Joe, I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about what it was like to make a funny game. Because I remember talking to a lot of our narrative designers back at Disruptor Beam, and they were saying that trying to write humor is one of the hardest things to write. Um, because it, it is. is. <laughs> it is very challenging to find what people are going to find funny, make sure things land at the right time. And I imagine tying that in with gameplay as well is really difficult. Can you talk a little bit about how you were able to kind of navigate the waters of trying to make a, not just a good game, but a funny game? Yeah, humor is pretty tricky to write. I've gotten a lot better at it over the years. And when you're talking about games, um, oftentimes games don't prioritize timing. And timing of content delivery and of joke delivery is one of the biggest pieces that is missing that you can kind of get away with in other other uh um in other games um more serious stories um by just having the story be conveyed through notes or through you know just spoken vo um uh comedy is also a double-edged sword because if it doesn't resonate with someone they'll roll their eyes or they'll hate it and when we were doing it well i feel like we were you know, like there are episodes of three out of 10 that I'm really proud of, um, especially in the second season. I mean, I'm proud of all of it, but the second season I feel like has some of the best writing that I've, I've ever done in my life. Um, 
the first two episodes in that I feel like are very successful uh, writing wise. Um, and uh, a lot of it was getting familiar with our tools, getting comfortable with our actors, knowing the kind of humor we were going after. Our sense of humor in the game was very much something that appealed to our wacky sensibilities. We weren't trying to be like another comedian. Um, and uh, hoping that people come along for the ride is, is part of the, the dice roll when you're writing humor. Again, you could look at Tim Schafer. He does it very well with Double Fine's projects. Um, and every time you add another person to the team, you risk changing that sense of humor a little bit. Um, hopefully you're adding to it in a new and exciting way, but you do you do change it. Um, and it's, it's definitely... Um, uh, you're adding another dice roll to the mix for sure. Um, uh, and if you care more about gameplay... I would strongly consider about whether or not you can pull off humor well. Um, it doesn't mean you shouldn't do it. Um, it's just, you know, know your priorities because it does take a lot of iteration to pull off well and a lot of practice just the time. So I got definitely better in my timing uh, and the animators for sure got way better in their timing over the course of 3 out of 10's development. Um, and they were great to start with too, but you know, you look at some of the stuff they did in the later season or some of the stuff they're doing now, they're, um, they've grown so much as a team. And I guess um, I'll have a quick follow up to that, which is um, how did you learn to let go as someone who had been working, you know, as a solo act and then with a with an external team um, and now with a, a dedicated team to seasonal, you know, releases and everything, especially you being the kind of the creative vision and, the, and of course, the, the owner of the company. How did you find letting go of your creative control from I have control over literally everything to I've only made one check in and even that was a joke? Um, okay, so I'm going to tell a little story then about this. I'm going to name drop here. I'm not, I'm not trying to impress you all, but I uh, found myself in a situation where uh, I was having a cup of tea with Warren Spector. Um, it is the highlight of my career. For those of you who don't know who Warren Spector is, he's the guy who made Deus Ex. Um, he has done a lot of games, but I loved Deus Ex as a kid. I thought it was an amazing game. Um, I, I like, in general, immersive simulations quite a bit. And I was delighted to pick his brain. Uh, and I literally was having a cup of tea, which sounds weird, but we were having a cup of tea and talking game design for three hours, just him and I. Um, it was, uh, yeah, it was like a highlight of my career. Uh, and it was really a, a fluke luck kind of situation. Um, but one of the things that he said to me that all that like resonated with me, um, I asked him something like, you know, how do you how do you go about you know, building your stuff, you've, you've got your hands in a lot of different things. A very similar question to what you just asked me. And he just said, I don't remember what his whole answer was, but he said, you know, you have to make sure that you, you trust your lieutenants. And those three words just like burned in my brain. I was like, trust your lieutenants. And I realized that I was like, oh my gosh, yeah, of course, of course. If you want to be able to put your babies in the hands of people that are going to do right by them, you have to trust the people you're doing it, you're, you're, you're handing off to um, completely. Uh, and, um, you know, over the course of Mother Gunship Forge, I really, I trusted my lieutenants. They've done a phenomenal job, better than I could have ever done if I were working day to day on a lot of these pieces. Uh, they've, they've, I can, because I've done so little check-ins on this game, I can look at it and be like, this is the best game that TPG has worked on. And I can say that uh, without feeling like I'm being cocky or something, I feel like it is a really, really successful project. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm trusting my lieutenants. Um, I'd actually like to ask a, a follow-up there if no one else has questions. Would it be possible for you to expand a bit more on the, the technical side of this on production that you talked a bit about, you know, first, being in, char uh, in charge of every, you know, either designing on your own and then essentially being a lead for a smaller group and then going entirely hands off. What is uh, your and then Terrible Posture Games way of kind of managing production roles on teams, how people move between them? I, I ask this because I have personally been struggling a lot with you know, with big companies, AAA, with things like movies as well, production is very streamlined. There is t very specific tiers. They're pretty similar from place to place. But when you move into the smaller teams or move between analog and digital, um, as I do specifically, 
every group will have a different name for what production is, how it functions, and it means that it's really difficult to actually navigate what works in general beyond a specific team. And so seeing that you've moved between these different kind of sizes and states, I was interested in what your experience with that has been and if you can specifically go into anything. Um, I should clarify a little bit. I'm not hands off. I'm actually very much hands on. I'm just not hands on in the build. I'm just constantly in meetings with people and talking to them directly. It's just not doing as much of the, the fun um, uh, engine side work. Uh, just to be clear, it's not like I'm off away in another another world. Um, uh, I am trying to be as in tune as I can be. Um, reality is just space and time notwithstanding. Um, so uh, when it comes to managing these teams and what they're up to and how we shift from one project to another, it is something again that stability has helped um, because I know that there's going to be a ramp up and we just assume there will be a ramp up. We also uh, don't do it as well as I would like. I feel like this is a place where we can constantly be improving. Um, especially as the world of, uh, of the things that we're working on branches out into hypotheticals. Um, and what I mean by that is there's a lot of different ways that, um, that Turbo Posture Games can expand in the future, and a lot of different ways that we can um, uh, roll our team out to different projects. And it's uh, uh, oftentimes not a set path as much as uh, you know, plan one, two, three, four, and five, and some of them have overlaps and some of them don't. So... Um, in a lot of cases, it's having to be flexible and take advantage of opportunities that come up and know that, you know, okay, well, plan six accounted for a, a room in the schedule for this sort of thing. So now we're kind of going down that path. Um, and I guess the biggest thing is that, you know, uh, when we started on our most recent round of projects, we had a very strong producer who kind of helped steer us in the right direction. Um, and now uh, I, I feel like that set us up for success. Um, and especially coming out of three out of 10, um, where we were releasing basically the, especially the first season, which each episode was released as its own product. Um, we got really good at this like idea of like, now we're starting, now we're moving off. This person's on to episode five, this person's on to episode six, you know, people are shifting kind of all over the place. We got kind of good at doing that juggling. Um, I don't know. It's kind of a non-answer, but I feel like we, we do need to practice more at it. We do need to get better. Um, and, uh, if there's any kind of skill been demonstrated here, it's the credit of the producers that we have on the on the, on the studio and the credit of the uh, um, the the again those lieutenants. Because um, I feel like where I have had in a in where I've had um, less time to support the team, they have picked up the slack um, and they've been very proactive with being like. This is a spot that Joe doesn't have time to be proactive on. I'm going to have to make this call. We're going forward with it this way. And I have to accept that and be okay with it. Um, you know, I can't go in there and, and, and disrupt the whole schedule because of something I thought that was, you know, it wasn't done the way I would have done it had I done my own scheduling. Um, I just have to, to uh, trust that they know what they're doing. So I guess, yeah, it comes back to trusting the lieutenants first and foremost. And, uh, and developing a lot of different ideas about how you would take the team forward based off of what chips come your way. So kind of a non-answer. We still need to practice at it. We're working at it more. I mean, it sounds like you have more experience than many. So, you know, if you're not great at it, who is? <laughs> uh, yeah, I guess it sums up to uh, things don't go well in this industry. Plan on it not going well. Plan for the plan to not go according to plan. And then it does go according to the plan because the plan was the plan would not work out. <laughs> That's um, not confusing at all. That attitude, though, it sounds silly, but that attitude actually has led to us uh, um, really being able to pivot in some nice ways, take advantage of opportunities that came our way. Um, and, uh, um, you know, I'm, I'm constantly thinking ahead about what the team is going to be working on in uh, um, the months coming up. But... You know, three years ago, I would be thinking about what the team would be working on the next week. And then it became the next month. And then it became the next year. And now it's like, okay, two years out. What are we working on two years from now? Um, and, and just gradually kind of expanding my window of, of where uh, the future goes. Okay. 
Hey, hey, Joe. Uh huh. So making uh, a VR game remotely, the remote team, uh, d- d- like definitely has to have some challenges. Um, uh, could you speak a little bit about some of the main challenges that uh, uh, the team ran into? Um, well, Anybody? the first challenge was dev kits because, you know, well, dev kits don't really exist. Uh, luckily, ev- let me back up a little bit. Um, anybody can do development work with a plain old Quest uh, or a Quest 2. So that's nice. Um, and they are relatively cheap compared to something like an Index. Um, but, uh, you know, the first thing was getting everybody a kit, um, getting everybody a headset that, that was going to be directly working on the project. Um, the next thing was uh, figuring out how to handle, like a lot of these things were shared with all of our projects. How do you handle a remote, a remote team for anything? Well, you got to figure out how to get source control for everybody. You got to figure out how you're going to handle documents and wikis and all these things that, you know, in the olden days would just be put on a company server and it would all be internal. And now a lot more of it is cloud-based um, and uh, leaning heavy on things like Discord. Um, you know, this, a lot of the more technical challenges, I would refer to the technical director who was able to overcome them. And, uh, you know, there were not, they were not small, especially when you're talking about trying to be very, very uh, savvy with performance on the quest. But, you know, he and I were both very, um, uh, very aware of that going into the project. So, you know, one of the first things we did on Mother Gunship Forge was reduce as we were building stuff, reduce the the polygon count and the draw calls and the materials and kind of like come up with something that looked good but was built for that spec. Um, yeah. And and then by we, I, I mean him and his team, not me, because I wasn't um, participating in that endeavor. But um, uh, we approached the project first with optimization. Optimization first, as we were building out the core tech, um, all the artists were doing optimization work. And that led us really... Uh, uh, off onto the right foot because we weren't having to make hard cuts down the line with um, which you know many of you know that that performance in VR is crucial um, you get anything below a certain frame rate and you're going to make people throw up all over the place so um, we were basically treating that as a as a feature keeping the performance up real high and an oculus really liked that approach they appreciated it and we're, we're like yeah you all are professionals you guys are thinking real quick uh, real hard about how this thing is going to play on its destination platforms. And that's, I think, also a sign of of, of uh, post-indiness, I guess, is that you're thinking very hard about the target platform at all times. Yeah, that, that, that's really cool. Um, and and so, so one of the things I was wondering about, with, um, with VR, it's more than just what, when you're, when you're playtesting, it's more than just uh, uh, pressing certain buttons on a controller or using the keyboard or other things that really don't matter that much. And we, we understand it when, say, somebody's sharing a screen. But with VR, because you're typically standing up and there's, diff- there's arm motions and other things involved, was there any uh, thing in terms of like um, uh, when playtesting to be able to see uh, two things, like what what the what the player uh, obviously is seeing uh, through the HMD, what is this a head mounted display, which is the headset, um, and uh, to be able to see what they're doing physically with their bodies, you know, which way they're they're moving their arms, and those sorts of things. Was was any of that kind of important? Um, no. <laughs> I mean, it seems like it should be, but we made design decisions early on to mitigate that a little bit. And we also very quickly set ourselves up to, um, to, to use a term that I kind of hate from the, from the tech biz to eat our own dog food. So we were playtesting. Everybody was playtesting, uh, as often as we could. We had regular Friday playtests. Um, and, uh, you know, if there were specific problems, the first line of defense was each other. Um, the bigger problems for us became more related to the randomization because there's a lot of randomization in the game and a lot of things that were stemming from uh, doing wacky things with the crafting system based off of what you could get. So it was more important for us to know which room you were in, or which gun parts you had, or the kinds of, of combinations you were you were pulling up. And we developed as robust of a, of a cheat menu and robust of a dev tool that we could um, to kind of support this. Um, and uh, uh, and then we just 
trained ourselves on how to report things. Um, but, uh, you know, we found that we didn't necessarily need to see what the players were seeing. Um, well, most of the time, there were some weird situations where we'd be, you know, someone would say like, oh, the entire world was brightly colored and we don't know why. And, you know, uh, the, the tech director would have a bit of head scratching there. Uh, and multiplayer also, that would be involving some, some weird situations and bugs that are uh, not trivial at all. Um, it's a lot of hard work to solve them. Um, but, uh, you know, we haven't needed to necessarily see the headset. We've been able to do a lot with just adding logging and making sure you're capturing the logging, making sure that you're um, uh, stepping through things in a measured and, and kind of, of a systemic way when you're testing for multiplayer bugs. And I don't pretend to know anything about it other than I can see the pain of the people who are working on multiplayer. Yeah. And it's, uh, it's, it's something that, you know, they take as good of approach they can to, to debugging and reproing bugs as they can. Um, and they're, they're those, uh, the folks working on the multiplayer bugs are experienced and, and, you know, knock them out, uh, as, as measured as they can, I guess. That's not the right phrase, but you all know what I'm talking about. Yeah, that's, yeah. um, it, it's, Logs. it's really good to know. Logging is a big part um, of it. <laughs> yeah. 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 The whole thing about, um, uh, it, it's, it, it's, it's good to know that, that needing to see what they're doing physically, what wasn't really important in this case. No. That, and and part, part of that is also because we don't like lean on, on like weird IK to try and place where the elbows of the player character are. We just let the guns be very much floating, uh, based off of your wrist and hands and your hands are where your hands are, but we don't try and, you know, this game is very focused on what it wants to achieve. Making sure you achieve the right placement for elbows is not one of our selling points. So why spend time want to be worried about instead that people haven't seen? Um, and so yeah. you don't have elbows. You don't need them in this game. Um, yeah, yeah. And like, like definitely what you're saying, all the variables with, with the guns has got to be <laughs> like pr pretty insane. <laughs> That's pretty exciting That's too, though. Like the yeah. crafting in this is much different than it's the same in some ways as the original Mother Gunship. It's way more intuitive to actually do, but the kinds of things that the guns can do is also really different. Um, the guns and the gun parts affect the entire game in way, way more systemic ways than the original game. Um, and I think that's part of what makes it a more interesting game to play is that um, it's a bit of a more calculated sense of crafting. You're not just affecting oh, okay, I've got another 12 chain guns on here. I'm going to give them more spread to all of their shots or something like that. You're affecting a lot more things. So yeah. I'm excited to see what people think. Yeah. Cool, thanks. It does look like a lot of fun. I'll have to check it out. Hmm. Um, I have a, a less tech-based question and more social-based question. Uh, is uh, I'm trying to formulate how I want to ask this. Is there any right or wrong group of people to have playtest your game? Like, should you have like a closed group? Should you have like a very open, like almost like a like a Google link that people could just go to, or just something like that that's a pretty complicated question that depends a lot on your what you're after what your goals are if you're being super secretive um then maybe you do want a closed group maybe you want to get people to sign ndas before time um maybe you need to because of your partners require it um if you're a developer who's just working on a game in their spare time maybe you want to be as open as possible and you want everyone to play test um and uh maybe that will lead to a better game. And there's a good argument that more people playtesting a game will lead to a better game. Um, I try and get as many people to playtest as possible because this is, uh, all of this makes for a stronger game. Um, and uh, if you aren't someone that is basically sought after as a, as a, as a target, um, someone who's made a lot of games before or someone who's working on a very high profile game, then the, the, the risk here is pretty low. Um, it, the risk being that someone would take your game and, you know, talk about it to the press um, or would take your game and, and resell it somewhere as their own game, which uh, would I have not really heard of happening, but I guess could. Um, the, the upsides of it being a stronger game overall, I think, are pretty high. 
Um, but it all depends upon your appetite for risk and also the kind of game you're making. Um, making the playtesting as easy as possible for the playtesters to get in and play the game will help you get more feedback, and more feedback is generally good. Um, and playtesting is not the same as QA. Um, if you can watch people playtest, you will learn way more about your game than you would from just a log or from QA notes. Playtesting is a much different experience. Um, it's gathering much more, much different things. QA people are there to break your game as hard as they can. Playtesters are there to tell you where the game is unintuitive in ways that you maybe didn't consider. QA can do that too, but you know, playtesters will will uh, um, will quickly stop playing your game because you're not paying them, and that itself can be a big message to you. Um, so uh, watching what they do, if you can get to an event, that's one of the biggest benefits of showing off at something like PAX. Um, is that you get people to play test and you can watch them. Um, and that's one of the biggest downsides of VR is that you can't watch them play test the game. You can't see where things are unintuitive. Things that you've done yourself a thousand times, you may not realize are impossible to mess with um, if you've never done dealt with it, uh, if you've never dealt with play testers live. And that is a, a, a downside of developing for VR, for sure. Thank you.